Newton's laws. Newton is the father of modern physics, and is most famous for having an apple drop on his head. Although this probably didn't actually happen, he did formulate three laws of motion which are fundamentally important in physics. So what are these laws of motion? Well, let's look at them one at a time. Newton's first law states that if there is no resultant force acting on an object, then its velocity will not change. It must either remain at rest or stay moving at a constant velocity. So, let's look at this in a bit more detail. First, what do we mean by resultant force? Well, a force is a push or a pull, and we actually represent it as a vector. And often, there can be more than one force acting on an object. So let's look at a simple example of a tug of war. The people on each side are pulling with an equal force of 500 newtons. We show forces in physics using arrows. The bigger the arrow, the bigger the force. As we can see, the arrows are in opposite directions, so we can say that the force to the right is 500 newtons, and the force to the left is minus 500 newtons. So if we add these forces together, we get a resultant force of zero. And we can see that the people playing tug of war are stationary. Now let's look at a car driving at a constant speed of 40 miles per hour. So what forces do we have acting here? Well, we have a forward thrust from the engine of 2,000 newtons, but we also have an air resistance or drag force of minus 2,000 newtons. So the resultant force here again is zero, but this time the car is not stationary, but is moving at a constant velocity. So that is Newton's first law. So Newton's second law follows directly on from this. It states that if there is a resultant force, then you get a change in velocity. You get an acceleration. So let's look at our two examples again. So here's the tug of war. And now the team on the right suddenly start pulling with a force of 700 newtons. So now we have 500 newtons to the left and 700 newtons to the right, giving us a resultant force of 700 newtons minus 500 newtons, or 200 newtons to the right. And as we can see, everybody starts moving in the direction of that force, off to the right. So what about our car? Well, it's still moving at a constant 40 miles per hour, but all of a sudden the driver puts his foot on the accelerator and the thrust force from the engine increases up to 5,000 newtons, with the drag staying the same. So now we have a resultant force of 5,000 newtons to the right, minus our 2,000 newtons to the left, which equals 3,000 newtons, and the car's speed starts to increase. So this is great. A resultant force gives an acceleration in the direction of the force. But how big an acceleration? Well, Newton found that acceleration is proportional to the force applied, but also depends on the mass of an object. And his second law can actually be given as an equation. Force equals mass times acceleration, or F equals MA for short. So let's look at our example of the car again. The resultant force was 3,000 newtons. Now the mass of the car is 1,000 kilograms, so what is its acceleration? Well, if force equals mass times acceleration, then we just rearrange this and we find that acceleration equals force divided by mass. So now we have 3,000 newtons divided by 1,000 kilograms, which gives us an acceleration of 3 meters per second squared. Let's quickly look at one more example. So now the driver slams on the brakes and we suddenly see there's no thrust forward anymore. And now on top of our 2000 newtons drag, we have a braking force of 1500 newtons acting backwards. So the total resultant force now is 2000 newtons plus 1500 newtons, which equals 3500 newtons backwards or in the opposite direction to the motion of the car. So this force is going to cause the car to slow down or decelerate. But at what rate? Well, let's use our equation again. So acceleration is force divided by mass. So in this case, we've got 3,500 newtons divided by 1,000 kilograms, which gives us a deceleration, because it's in the opposite direction to the motion, of 3.5 meters per second squared. Finally, let's look at Newton's third law, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. 
So let's look at a really simple example of this, a book resting on a table. Now the book is stationary, so we know there must be no resultant forces acting here from Newton's first. But there are forces acting. The book has a mass, so there must be a force down equal to its weight, its mass times gravity. But the book's not moving, so the resultant force must be zero. So there has to be an equal and opposite reaction upwards from the table. The table is pushing on the book with a force equal to the book's weight. In fact, this was the same in the car and all the other examples we looked at earlier. But we just ignored it as it didn't impact on the problems we were looking at. Another example of this is if we had two ice skaters standing looking at each other. Now they both have the same mass in this example. The skater on the left pushes the skater on the right, but they both move off in opposite directions. This is because without realising it, when the skater on the left pushed the skater on the right, she experienced an equal and opposite force and was pushed back as well. So that's Newton's third law of motion, and it comes in much more important later on. Let's quickly recap what we've learned here. Newton's first law of motion, if no resultant force acts on an object, then its velocity won't change. It stays at rest or moving at a constant velocity. The second law, a resultant force will cause an acceleration, which can be found using F equals MA. And finally, the third law, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction.